Shalom Chavayim, I'm Stephen Steven Benun. You're watching Israeli News Live, a production of the Noon Institute. If you only knew, that's the title of today's broadcast. And friends, I realize that as you look, as you come on to the broadcast this evening and you see the length of the broadcast, it's not a short broadcast. And the subject matter, as we go into this, we're going back into 1 Samuel, looking at that redemption process of Israel, and you might say, well, Steve, you just spoke about this recently. And you might think, okay, I'm not going to watch today's broadcast. Don't do that, friends, please. What God has revealed to me here in the last couple of days is very much breathtaking. And it has troubled me to no end. And so this is why I titled the video, If You Only Knew. Because this is a very serious situation. I think it is critical that you really listen and share it with everybody you can. I'm not popular, guys. I'm seeing the popularity for the stance that I take, whether it be in news, whether it be in uh, uh, prophecy. Slowly but surely, those that don't have ears to hear are definitely turning away. And that's very sad because... uh, it's just, it's just, it's a serious hour, friends, a very late hour. And we just, we don't have time to play church. We really don't. And the thing is, what I'm trying to do is to warn you of the evils that are coming. As I shared with the other day about the hirelings, the hirelings, ministers that are only out there for, for money, that don't really care uh, for the sheep. They're not worried about warning you that there is a wolf in sheep's clothing, you know, even as Romulus and Remus, the, the founders of Rome itself, as the story, the legend goes, they nursed the, 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 uh, a wolf. A wolf found them as babies. They'd been abandoned, and the wolf finds them. They nurse them. And then later, oddly enough, shepherds find them and then care for the boys and raise them. There again, the shepherds. What are the shepherds of? Of a sheep. But you have little kids that have been raised with a wolf. A wolf in sheep's clothing. Maybe that's where we get the cliche of today. I don't know. But the point is, God said to us, you know, Yeshua himself, Jesus teaching, warning us about the hireling, that the sheep will know the voice of the true shepherd, but the hireling, the one that is only being paid to take care of the sheep, he's going to flee from you when the wolf is coming. And yet the prophecy that Jesus gave us is laying there and people are totally missing it. And it's very serious, friends. It's very serious. And, and, and it's very difficult right now to put all this into perspective for you. But I need to try to do and to share with you what God has revealed to my heart, that it might be a blessing to you and that it might help you as we're in truly the closing hours of time. So if you only knew, if you only knew what was really happening in the world, it would really make you think differently. It would really drive you to your knees and begin to pray, and not only for yourself, but for your family, for your loved ones. And believe me, as my popularity falls, why? Because people are going to the very churches that have turned their back on God. They think they haven't. Maybe they still have the revival, so to speak, but they've turned their back on God. They have rejected Yeshua as being king. They might say they haven't, but they have. All right, so even though we're going into some familiar scriptures, don't stop the video. Watch the video. All right, watch the video, because believe me, we're going to talk about things you have not heard. All right, let's get into it. We're going back into Samuel. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel and to Ramah. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 4 there. And they said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. See, so Samuel's sons did not do what Samuel, they weren't godly men. They weren't doing like they should do. But the things displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. Now we know the story. God goes on and he says, Samuel, they didn't reject you. They have rejected me. Let me, let me show you that part there. Next verse at the bottom half, but they have rejected me that I should not be king over them. You know, I think Pilate had a little bit more insight in who Yeshua was when he came, when he, when he put the sign over the cross that said, uh, King of the Jews. You see, your king had come down and he was in bodily in a body of flesh. Yeshua himself 
I know that it was the Jews that handed him over. There was the Jews that rejected him. It was the children of Judah, the children of Levi, the children of the Benjam Benjamin as well. This is why, by the way, this is why Joseph put that cup in Benjamin's bag. You see, we read this and it says, you know, Joseph says, do you not know that I can divine with this cup? And everybody makes it look like, oh, Joseph got into witchcraft because he was down in Egypt. No, you take it out of context. You see, in other words, he had divine revelation from God. And the cup itself was because he knew that Benjamin would reject him. His own brother's sons would reject his, the greater Joseph, Yeshua, when he would come. What, what is it? I forget how many hundreds of years later. This is what he was talking about. He was prophesying of Benjamin's rejection. This is why he puts the cup in Benjamin's bag. Knowing that Benjamin would cry out for the greater Joseph, Yeshua, cry out for his blood. Just like his other brothers had cried out for Joseph's blood. All right? So, and of course, Jesus was rejected at the communion table. This is when uh, we know that uh, Judas betrayed him. Now, according to the scriptures, Judas was uh, of the tribe of Judah and not that of Benjamin, but yet nonetheless, the Benjamites were crying out, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. And yeah, they may have meant it for evil, but had it not been for God in his mercy, Having that blood as an atonement, that blood actually covered them. Just like when Joseph's brothers take this coat, uh, Joseph's coat, and they kill the innocent lamb and put the blood on the coat, and they take it back to his fathers. Is this your son's coat or no? Well, they meant it to hide the sins of the, the, their sins of what they did to their brother. But had God, had there not been that blood, they would have died. God would have required Joseph's blood at their hands. All right. Now, all these are types and shadows. Now, so here's what happens. They wanted a king. And here Christ was. I mean, Christ, Pilate puts the sign over him, says, you know, Jesus, king of the Jews. And the Jews were angry. He's not our king. He's not our king. See, you were rejecting your king just like you did. Not just, not just the house of Judah. All 12 tribes. There were no two. There wasn't the house of Judah and the house of uh, Israel at that time. And Samuel was here. It was all 12 tribes. You rejected God as being your king then. And how I know it's one and the same. The difference is the son of God, Yeshua, was God inside of the man. Because why? In reality, we had rejected God during the time of Moses. When God wanted to come down and have a personal relationship with us, as he did with Moses, where he spoke face to face, and the 12 tribes of Israel cried, let God not speak only unto Moses, lest we die. We're going to get into that one in just a little bit. All right? Because that's where we really rejected God. And so God took the secondary method, which happens with Samuel the prophet being one of the prophets, like in the case of Moses. And now we reject God from being king using his secondary method. And so God had prophesied to Moses even. He says, I will raise up a prophet like unto you. Among your brother, he will be raised up. Why? So that the king could come down in a human body because they couldn't handle God in his glory, in his, in his majesty, and the pillar of fire that he would come down as he spoke to Moses in the whirlwind. And Moses even sees the back of a man. They could not handle God like that. So God finally says, I will raise up a prophet like unto you. And that'll be the one that'll be raised up for your brethren. That was the Mashiach. That was the Messiah. That was the king himself coming and living in a body. You don't believe he wasn't the king? Let me show you he was the king. When God spoke to Moses at the burning bush, how did he speak to him? That burning bush, Mount Sinai, Okay, Harsini, and it was the eight Sinai, which was a thorn tree or a thorn bush. All right, that's what Sinai is. God spoke from the midst of the amber fire. The, the bush was on fire, but not consumed. It was, a, it was like a light of fire. Okay, and God spoke in the midst of that, from the midst of that, the fire was only the angel of his presence. That's what, in other words, that was the form in which God was enveloped in. 
And from the midst of that fire, God spoke out. And then when he was on the cross, God was inside the body of Yeshua, the spirit of Almighty God, in the fullness, not just in part, we get a portion of it. Yeshua had the fullness of the spirit of God within him. And from the midst of the thorn bush, the crown on his head, God was speaking again. And just like he was rejected during the times when Israel didn't want to see him when Moses was there, and then he was rejected with Samuel, and they wanted a king instead. See, we're always making a mistake of trying to put a king over us. And that's what we have missed. If you only knew, you put a king in, your, in, in the place of Christ once again. And friends, let me tell you something. I realize individually many of you have Yeshua as your king, and I understand that, and I appreciate that. God help you, and God hold on to that. But let me tell you something. What's happening right now, there is a major move in the evangelical, the Pentecostal, the Baptist, the Methodist, the Catholic circles, all for tearing down the Middle East and bringing about wars and murdering people and murdering the Eastern Orthodox because they don't agree with you or whatever, and they're all for it. You're in a move for Babylon. You're in a move for, for something that is totally false and not of God. And this is why I'm bringing this out to you. It's something you've got to know. So what we see here, they wanted a king. They rejected God as being their king, all right? Now, Many of you guys know, this just an old story here, raw story, it's called uh, my, uh, King Bibi Holds On for Third Term as Israel's Prime Minister. You know that when Netanyahu was elected to be Prime Minister of Israel in 1996, the people ran through the streets crying out, Bibi, King of the Jews. Now, I personally believe that this was a portion of prophecy being fulfilled. We know the story that Mike Evans anoints Bibi Netanyahu or Benjamin Netanyahu long before he enters into politics, after he met with Menachem Begin, which I do think this it could have been genuine. It also could have been a setup from the beginning. Because Menachem Begin, remember, he was never for in 1946 and up to 48, even at the 48 war. When the state of Israel was being formed, Menachem Begin opposed that of Moshe Sharit, which was a foreign minister at that time who had met with Pope, Fran uh, Pope Paul the uh, excuse me Pope Pope Pius the twelfth. He was in uh, opposition with Ben Gurion because these two men here wanted to divide up Israel and make Jerusalem an international city with an international guarantee to a United Nations force and it was going to be given to the Pope of Rome. And Menachem Begin wasn't for that. He was for liberating Jerusalem as part of Israel. All right. And so when he became prime minister years later, Rome knew there was a problem. 67 war had already happened. They had lost Jerusalem. There was, there was now an outcry of the Vatican. Before, before the 67 war, there was no cry out of anything, no big deal about Jerusalem or anything, because why? The Vatican already had a nice deal worked out with the Arabs. They had autonomy over the sacred sites that they wanted in the old city of Jerusalem, so there was no problem. But then this happens. And so Menachem Begin, we know that Mike Evans goes to him. And of course, the story is allegedly told. I have to say allegedly because I used to really believe it, but as I'm seeing things unfold, I really question. And as I see Mike Evans' loyalty to the Vatican, I really question the things that are going on now. So at any rate, he supposedly anoints Benjamin Netanyahu, prophesies over him, and says he'll be prime minister not once but twice. He also speaks about being a bridge builder to Menachem Begin. Now, Netanyahu does become prime minister in 96, and of course the Jewish people ran through the streets and elected him. He's the head of the Likud party, and, uh, and they cried out, Bibi, king of the Jews. Now, I have said this story many times to you before. I'd met this Jewish family in Destin, Florida back in 1996, and not even knowing what was going to come out of my mouth, the Lord began to speak to, through me to this Jewish family, uh, who is literally Israeli family, not just a Jewish family. They were Israelis. They were actually there on vacation. And the Lord shared with this woman through me, 
me not even knowing that I was going to say the words that came out of my mouth. I said, isn't it interesting that they, they elected Netanyahu as prime minister, but the people were crying out, be king of the Jews. And she said, yes, it's, it's just wonderful, isn't it? I said, yes, but it'll never work. And to kind of make the story a little bit shorter for the sake of time, she was dumbfounded by it. And I said, it can't work. I said, you have to understand, sister. I said, the way we left God is the way we must return to God. Now, I didn't have the full revelation at the time. I only got a partial revelation as God was revealing this part to me because of what was happening in Israel. And as I began to speak to her, not even knowing how these words were coming out of my mouth, I said to this lady, I said, we left God when we left Samuel the prophet and we wanted a king to lead us into battle and to judge us and these things here. This is when we left God. And I said, yes, we got a couple of good kings. We got David, we got Solomon, even though Solomon ends up going into idolatry himself but uh, at the end of his ministry. But at the beginning, he, did, he was a very good king. I said, but finally we ended up with Ahab. And what did Ahab do? He brought idolatry from the Zidonians. He brought uh, <laughs> idolatry into Israel by marrying Jezebel. All right? I said, and then finally in 70 AD, I skip over the part about Yeshua because for some reason the Lord didn't want me to say that to her. I said, but in 70 AD, because of the covenant that, we, that the Maccabees had made with the Romans, the Romans turned on us. And our city is ransacked by the Roman soldiers, by Titus, the Roman general, and we end up going into exile. The temple is burned. And I said, but if you'll notice, the way we left God is the way you go back to God. You have to go back where you left him at. I said, now, we're on our road home. We've returned back, we were exiled, now we have returned to the promised land, and it was the house of Judah, not the house of Israel at that time, Samaritans as well. And we're back in the homeland. I said, and now we have elected a prime minister that we call the king of Israel. She said, that's true, that's right, you're right. I said, and the people are running through the streets crying, Bibi, king of the Jews. I said, but he must fail. And I said, because God didn't want us to have a king, he wanted to be the king. I said, so Netanyahu will never work as a king. And it really caught her attention. I said, but, I said, is it not true that on every, and here we are, we're coming into the Passover season now. This is the week for Passover. I said, isn't it true that at every Say there, every Passover, when the table is set, most Jews keep the tradition that you put a cup of wine on the table for Elijah, the prophet Eliyahu, and you open the door to say to God, we are ready for your prophet. Now, the only reason we do it for Elijah because of the prophecy of Malachi chapter 4, or in the Jewish Bible, chapter 3. We don't have a chapter 4, it's just a continuation as it goes down, all right? But Elijah is to come. Now, many people would say, well, that was John the Baptist. John the Baptist is Elijah of Malachi chapter 3. And Elijah, Jesus, does a tribute of turning the hearts of the fathers to the children, but he never attributes the turning of the heart of the children to their fathers. I said, but we leave that cup on the table and we leave the door open. She said, that's exactly right. I said, now. I said, when the king fails, then we will cry out for the prophet Elijah. I said, and then when we get the prophet Elijah, then the Mashiach can come. That blew her away. Now, I'm going to take you deeper into this, though. Because the thing is, you have to remember, it wasn't just the house of Judah that rejected God and wanted a king. It was all 12 tribes of Israel did it, according to Samuel's prophecy. All right, so let's go next. I want to take you to Psalm 83, because what's been going on in the background is something very sinister. You see, it's not only that God has a way of redemption, in a way of reconciliation. The reconciliation is reconciling you back to God. But also Rome has been very much aware. The wolf, as Jesus says in his prophecy, and I think that's in Matthew chapter 10. I forget, you guys will remember. We spoke about it the other day. 
When Jesus spoke about the hireling, those ministers that are only hired to kind of guard the sheep. You know, now I'm not against ministers that, uh, you know, you, you have to make a living. This is what you do for your, you know, you, you, you dedicate your entire life to it. According to uh, Malachi, in fact, the, the, the priests were the ones that were to receive a tithing of the people. This is how they lived. All right. Uh, I know my wife used to say, well, then only the Levites should receive tithes. I said, okay, well, whatever, you know, but, <laughs> you know, um, we won't go into that issue there. But interesting point nonetheless. But the thing is, is ministers have gone beyond that. It's more about how wealthy they can get. And when Rome is, the, when we know we've identified Rome as the wolf for the very fact that Rome was, the, was the, the, the story of the discovery of Rome and the Vatican full of these wolf images everywhere, we know then that Rome is that wolf. And Jesus even said that the, 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 the wolf only comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Now, yes, yeah, somebody made a comment on one of the videos I did. They said, that brother, that's the devil. Sure it is. Who do you think the wolf is? It's the devil in sheep's clothing. And if it's not the spirit of God, it's a demonic spirit. And a human being can be possessed of a devil. We know this from the maniac of Gadaria for just one of many examples. But what did he say? To steal, kill, and destroy. What did Rome do under Titus? Now that wasn't, it wasn't papal Rome at the time, but under Titus, what did they do? They came down, they killed the people in Jerusalem, they stole the temple treasures, and they destroyed the temple itself and ransacked most of the city. So rest, rest the case on that issue right there. Now, let me show you something though. Psalm 83, the famous psalm that everybody calls the, psalm, the war psalm. This is a psalm of war. It's not really a psalm of war. Pay attention to what it says. A, song, a, a psalm of Asaph. O God, keep thou not silence. Remember that right there. Keep thou not silence. Hold not thy peace and be not still. O God, for lo, thine enemies are in an uproar. And they that hate thee have lifted up the head. Who hated Yeshua? Who are the enemies of Yeshua? It was Rome at the time. He came to his own, his own received him not. That was Israel, that was his own. But he says thine enemies, and the enemy at the time was Rome. They hold crafty converse against thy people. Wow, that sounds interesting. Crafty converse against thy people, the children of Israel, and take counsel against thy, they say treasured ones. The word in Hebrew is not treasured ones, okay? Why do they always mess up the translations? It's unbelievable. Al Sufanecha, Sufanecha, Safon is where the word comes from. You ever hear the, the song before, Billy Beat Sanfonti? Billy Beat Sanfonti, it's in my heart, I have hidden, hidden Safon, like Melek Safon, the king of the north, it's also used for the word north, but Safon literally means hidden. Hidden is what it is. All right, so they have taken counsel against thy hidden ones. Who did God hide? Who did he hide? We can say he hide, hid Enoch. We can say he hide, hid Elijah. And there is some argument as to whether or not he hid Moses or not. Because we know that Moses goes up, he steps up on the rock, and he's gone. All right? And here's the interesting thing that gets me about this one here. Because I always have challenged this myself. Because Satan, according to the New Testament, was in an argument with Michael the archangel about the body of Moses. Why do you think he argued about the body of Moses? Because Satan is the angel of death. When you die, he's supposed to get your body. And so he was in an argument about the body of Moses because he didn't get that body. And we know that Moses must have been preserved somehow. Even if he did die, we know the angels took him away from what we understand and buried him. But the point is, is he was seen on Mount Transfiguration with Yeshua right along with Elijah. And there was a prefigure of the prophecy of Zechariah, the two uh, olive trees on either side of the golden lampstand. They were standing on either side of Yeshua and appeared before the apostles that were there. So, 
take that into thought. Anyway, they have who they they have come. They've taken crafty converse against thy people, and also a counsel against thy hidden ones. They have said, "Come, let us and cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance." For they have consulted together with one consent against thee. Do they make a covenant? Okay. Now here's what gets interesting, friends. I'm going to get this screen to roll up on here for me. Make a covenant. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagarites, Gebal, Ammon, Amalek, Philistia, and the inhabitants of Tyre. It names Arab nations, but the tents of Edom are your churches. Adam is Rome, and we'll prove that in a little bit through Obadiah, because Obadiah refers to Esau. Esau is Adam. He is the red one, right? But the tents of Adam and the Ishmaelites. So what is it? When you see Rome beginning to join together with the Ishmaelites, the Sunni Muslims, Moab, the Hagarites, and all these other Arabic nations that are in the Middle East there, and they begin to join together. And not only is it Rome doing it, but even the evangelical community, the Pentecostal community, and all them, they're coming together to form what? A one world religion. That what? That the name of Israel will be no more in remembrance. They need to blot out the name of Israel. Friends, this is not the country of Israel. I used to think that as well. It's not the nation of Israel. They're, that is in type, yes. But they want to blot out Israel through a reconciliation that Rome is spearheading, as it says, the tents of Adam, these churches that are joining in with the Vatican to do exactly that. Jeez, boy. So now you have to set the stage. So see, they already knew. David, seen it in the Psalms. And they, yet Israel is crying out, Oh God, be not silent. That has a lot to do with when they cried out as well. When God says, You will cry out in that day because of your king, and I will not hear you. So let's look at what's going on then. So now we can see that Rome and even the churches have joined together, not just the churches, but the Muslim world as well. Erdogan that's doing the fighting. Did you guys, did you, have you forgotten Cardinal Bia, who Alberto Rivera, the Jesuit that left the Catholic Church after being a Jesuit, what, for 19 years, 20 years, something like that, he left the Catholic Church. He came out to warn the Christian community that the Vatican was on a plan to reunite all the religions and bring them back under the Catholicism. He said that Cardinal Bia taught him at the Vatican that the, the Islamic religion, the Muslim religion, was created by the Vatican. Notice, I mean, look at all the things they do. Let me just share something with you. I'll show you something here real quick. Let me, let me see if I can pull this up real fast. Here we go. All right. One second. This here is in Israel. My wife took this video. Notice the, the, the beads that the Muslims use. All right, both of them. Just like Catholic Rosary. He's a Palestinian guy and a Palestinian woman, Muslim woman, dressed like a nun, and they both use prayer beads. Isn't that weird? I mean, but why? If Rome created this religion, as it has been said by uh, uh, Alberto Rivera, the former Jesuit, and he actually goes into detail. He says that when, um, when um, he said when the Vatican was trying to find a way to stomp out the true Christians that were in northern Africa, which were children from both houses of the house of Israel and the house of Judah that had believed Yeshua to be the Messiah, because remember Yeshua said to the apostles, "Go out into only the lost house of the excuse me, the lost sheep of the house of Israel." All right, they were going only out into that lost sheep of the house of Israel, and they had grown in numbers and strength, and Constantine couldn't stand seeing this. And of course, this was, that was years later, I'm sorry. Constantine, of course, in 325 AD, he sees all the different beliefs in Christianity according to what history tells us about it. And he tries to unite church and state together because he sees that he can't prevail over the church. So therefore, he figures if he unites church and state together, then he can control the church. This is how we ended up with the Catholic Church or the so-called universal church, the Vatican. 
All right? Now, I'm going to get into that in just a moment. But what happened, though, according to uh, Cardinal Bia that was instructing Alberto Rivera, that growing numbers, and this was a couple of hundred years even after the formation of the Vatican, they saw that still that movement of true believers that were not involved in church-state religion. They were not involved in a new world order as it was then. That's what the Vatican was all about back in 325 AD. Constantine was creating a new world order, uniting church and state like they're trying to do today. That's why they want to disarm Americans. We'll get into that, maybe. I don't know if I have time for that, but anyway. So what did they do? They found Muhammad, and then they trained Muhammad. They sent him to Northern Africa. They trained him under the uh, Jesuits that were there. And they used Kaji, who was, Kaji was a, a, a Catholic, excuse me, a Catholic woman. She was actually a Muslim, not a Muslim, but a, a, an Arabic woman to begin with, very wealthy. She was a convert to the Vatican, to the Catholic Church. And she'd given all of her wealth to the Catholic Church. But they persuaded her, even though she was much older than Muhammad, to marry him. Because they had spread throughout all of northern Africa and through the Arabic world that there was coming a prophet that was going to, to help unite them together. And so the Vatican back then was looking to bring up an Arabic warrior because why? They needed a military to do the dirty work. And Muhammad galvanized the Arabic world and then they turned on those believing Christians, those true Jews that were believing, sharing the gospel through all of northern Africa that were winning converts. And then they sent in then their faithful Arabic armies that were now converted to Islam to destroy them. Part of the Crusades. Okay? This is what Erdogan is doing today. Why do you think he met with the Pope of Rome? Same thing. The Inquisition is, or not Inquisition so much in this case here, but the, the Crusades are again going on and stomping out all those that don't agree with the Vatican. This is why the Pope doesn't bring in the Christians from the Middle East as refugees. He only brings in the Sunni Muslims because they are his fighters. Why do you think he's got them all through Europe? To destroy all of Protestantism that doesn't agree with him. That's a different story altogether. But anyway, let me get back to what we were on here before I get carried away in another direction. So Rome has been plotting and planning for a long time, a long time. Now, this is on the catholicherald.co.uk. Uh, it says, somewhere in Pope Francis's office is a document that, that could alter the course of Christian history. It declares an end to the hostilities between Catholics and Evangelicals and says the two traditions are now uni united in mission because we are declaring the same gospel. The Holy, no such thing as the Holy Father, is thinking of assigning the text in 2017, the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, which he did, alongside the Evangelical leaders representing roughly one in four Christians in the world today. Signing it with evangelical leaders. Francis is convinced that the Reformation is already over. He believes it ended in 1999, the year the Catholic Church and the Lutheran World Federation issued a joint declaration on justification, the doctrine at the heart of Luther's protest. You know, it's so funny. The evangelicals just fell for this. Didn't even get it, did you? You know, Luther just came out with justification. But then you had... Wesley that came out with sanctification. And then you had the Pentecostals come out with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But of course, you know, as long as, the, as long as the Catholics now are speaking in tongues, and I'm not against Catholic people, please understand, I'm not even against the Pope of Rome, but I'm against the agenda that he's doing. I'm not against Catholic people because I realize God says in Revelation 18.4, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins. So God's got some good godly people in there that are being all caught up in a bunch of nonsense. All right? Now, this is what he does there, right? Now, here's what's interesting. Everything that's been happening in government and religious circles has all been working towards one goal. And that's to make the Pope of Rome the king of Israel. As God says, or, or excuse me, as I said to the, 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 the Jewish lady, the way you leave God is the way you have to go back. 
And it wasn't just the house of Judah that had a king over them. But the Vatican was making it look like it was. Because remember, over in Psalm 83, they knew that the hidden ones were coming back. They know there are two witnesses. They know that there must be an Elijah. They, whether you want to say it's Moses or Enoch or whatever the case is, they still know that there is an Elijah that must come. And there's two of them coming. So Rome is trying to figure out a way to make sure they fulfill prophecy that the evangelical world, the Christian world, will accept it as being so. And all the while, you're fulfilling prophecy in a way that is not good at all. All right? Now, in the political world, Mideast peace deal in nine months, says John Kerry. How many times I've told you about this? U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry has said Israeli and Palestinian negotiators have agreed to work towards a final Middle East peace agreement over the next nine months. As I said to you, when God showed me this, when John Kerry announced it, I don't know, maybe a month or so after he announced it, I came out, I shared with you, and I said that Rebecca's vision was a prophecy. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife. This is over in uh, Genesis 25. Because she was barren, and the Lord let himself be entreated of him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And the children struggled together within her, and she said, If it be so, why, wherefore do I live? Or literally, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb. Two peoples all right, shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. Two nations. Esau and Jacob. The Romans and Israel. Because we know Esau is now living in Rome. And so when we look at this nine-month negotiation that John Kerry started, we find out that when it ended, Nine months later, the articles here, like the one here on the Washington Post, Kerry's nine-month quest for Middle East peace ends in failure. His peace plan did not end in failure. The thing is, is we were led to believe that the peace process was over a Palestinian and Israeli state, when in reality it was not. Just like we have the Vatican state inside of a Roman state, we have Washington, D.C., Inside of Virginia, which is a state within a state, you have Britain, you have a state within a state in England there, and at the same time, the Vatican was working on making that fourth state within a state, and that's the old city of Jerusalem becoming a Vatican state. All right? So it was not a failure. And the reason we know it was not a failure, because why? Now, the article here was speaking about an arson that happened after the Pope did his mass in the upper room at a church there in, in Israel. But the point was, less than 30 days after that nine-month negotiation, Pope Francis comes there to Israel, to Mount Zion, and sits on Mount Zion with his crown on his head, which directly below him is the tomb of King David and also believed to be the tomb of Solomon, and he takes his place as king of Israel. Now, there was a major cry amongst the Orthodox community against the Pope coming. Not only was it a cry against them, you had some, not many, some Christian churches were, you know, very few were speaking out against this. Why has the Pope done this? How could this be done? It was in the Israeli newspapers. How could the Pope do this without even a referendum? That was mainly given over Mount Zion to the Vatican is what it was. That's what uh, Guglielmo Miotti wrote. But the point was, the Pope could have never pulled this off had he not got the house of Israel to agree to what he was going to do. And that's what most people have missed. When the Lord revealed to me about the Jewish lady that day that we were on our way home, that we had to go back to God the way we left God. We had to have a king that would fail. I did not realize that the only way that that can be corrected is for all of Israel. All 12 tribes have to have a king in place that will fail. And that king is none other than this man right here, Pope Francis. I'm not saying he's a bad guy because of this. I'm just saying that the agenda is not of God. All right? 
The Gentiles not of God. Now you might say, brother, what do you mean? The house of Israel, the house of Israel has been dispersed to all the world. Many of them are sitting as Christians in churches, evangelicals, etc. You will find, as my good friend once said to me, he said, Stephen, the way you know when a person has got Israelite heritage is they will have a passion for Israel and not know why. That was said to me by Gershon Solomon. He said, it never fails. They are the ones that have Israelite heritage. Now, he said Jewish heritage, but it's Israelite heritage. You're either the tribe of Israel, the tribe, uh, or the house of Israel, the tri house of uh, Judah. And they have a love for the country, and they don't know why. And it's because of their Jewish heritage. And we find that amongst evangelicals more than any other group. And the Pope of Rome knew this. So he made a plan. He was, before the nine-month negotiations ever ended, Rome was already working towards that as well. Remember, the reconciliation, he had to get the Lutherans back. Lutherans, not, they don't really care that much about Israel to begin with. We already see that. It's obvious. They don't care. But the evangelical community does. And as I read to you in the article over here, what is it? One in four Christians in the world today are evangelicals. Evangelicals are the major ones when it comes to uh, supporting Israel. All right? So, what happens? About three or four months before the Pope does the Mass on the upper room there with a crown on his head, this young man, Tony Palmer, goes to Kenneth Copeland's ministerial meeting in Texas. And in this particular video, he speaks about that when he's talking to the Pope of Rome, which happened to be a good friend of his before he ever became a Pope, and Bishop Palmer, he's from uh, um, an Anglican church, but he worked very close in a reconciliation process with the Vatican. And Pope Francis was a good friend of his before he was Pope. And the Pope reached out to Tony Palmer because Tony Palmer was very good friends with Kenneth Copeland. And that's what Rome needed, a link. Now you want to talk about Jesuit infiltration? Alberto Rivera said that the Jesuits had infiltrated churches of every rank and form, every business, every political circle there is in the world. Believe me, they were infiltrated into these circles as well. Speaking of infiltrations, just to even show you before any of this ever even happened, and I won't call the person's name because it's a friend of mine, but she came to my house one day when I lived in Fort Myers, and she said to me, Stephen, you're causing a lot of problems for the work that we are trying to do for Israel. And I was blown away by this statement. I'm like, what, what do you mean? What am, I, what am I causing? What is the problem? This person was a special envoy to the United Nations. But because of our friendship and because for her own safety, I will not speak about her name. And then she goes on to elaborate with me because she was of Jewish descent, her father's side from the house of Israel, like my father's side is. And she said to me that what you don't understand is that we are very much, I have a very close friend, I had a very close connections before I became an evangelical to the Catholic Church. Of an archbishop that I'm very close to that has direct ties with the Pope of Rome, which was Pope Francis, by the way, at the same time. And we are working towards a reconciliation process with Israel. And she said, and the things that you are saying are hindering the process that we have with the Pope of Rome and bringing a reconciliation to Israel. I said, do you have any idea do you have any idea what Rome's real agenda is? And she told me, she says, you tell me, 
if it's true, she says, I will stand with you and fight against them. And that was never the case. It never happened. I have seen Jesuit influence from every direction towards our own ministry. As I stated before, they're going to take, when they finish with this reconciliation process, Israel will no longer be in remembrance. All right? Israel will not be. It's not so much the state of Israel. It'll be something totally together, altogether different. Now, I want to share with you just for a moment, though, I want to share with you something that Tony Palmer said at this minister's meeting with Kenneth Copeland. The evangelical group. This is where Pope Francis needed to galvanize the evangelical community who are strong supporters of Israel to be sure, to be sure he could pull off what he was going to do a few months down the road after John Kerry's nine-month negotiations were over. Look, he was working the political side as well as the spiritual side. Watch what Tony says here. Let's listen for a couple of minutes. They wrote this together. Because in the Protestant church, there are a lot of cheap salvations. People were getting born again, but no fruit whatsoever. And because we didn't even look for fruit, it wasn't the issue. Because it wasn't necessary for salvation. And no, it's not. But it's a good judge if you are saved. So what these two churches did, they put the two definitions together. Listen to it. I'm reading verbatim from the Catholic Vatican website. Justification means that Christ himself is our righteousness in which we share through the Holy Spirit in accord with the will of the Father to, together we Catholics and Protestants Lutherans believe and confess that by grace alone in faith in Christ's saving works and not because of any merit on our part we are accepted by God and receive the Holy Spirit who renews our hearts while equipping and calling us to good works. This brought an end to the protest of Luther. Brothers and sisters, Luther's protest is over. Is yours. In 1999, no. this was signed I'll tell you flat out, by no. the Lutheran Church, the Federation Worldwide. Later, about five years later, the Worldwide Methodists signed the same agreement. But as of today, we still have had no Protestant evangelical that will stand up and sign this agreement to agree with our brothers and sisters that we are saved by grace through faith to good works. And I believe that's something that needs to be fixed. There's a challenge for you. So the protest has been over for 15 years. And I get a bit cheeky here because I challenge my Protestant pastor friends. If there is no more protest, how can there be a Protestant church? Maybe now we're all Catholics again. <laughs> but we are reformed. We're Catholic in the universal sense. We are not protesting the doctrine of salvation by the Catholic Church anymore. We now preach the same gospel. We now preach you are saved by grace through faith. Alone. The word alone was the argument for 500 years. The word alone is there. You can read it yourself. The protest is over. The protest is over. So let me pray. And then we'll start the video. Now, the thing is, what's serious about this particular issue here, to me, it's much greater than just Luther's uh, thesis that he put up on his wall. And uh, the protest, of course, over this one issue there, but there's far many more issues there. Christ must be king, not a pope of Rome. And here's where it gets very troubling. Um... In Revelation 
chapter 17, we read, And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. The waters are peoples, places there, or countries even, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Isn't it interesting? They've been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. And here the Pope is having in the upper room the communion service with the wine, which, by the way, was men only. We'll go into that in just a moment. So he carried me away into the spirit, into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads, ten horns, and the woman who... Uh, was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her, of her fornication. And upon her, her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. The, 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 the daughters in this case here, because she is a mother, she has daughters, they're harlots. Those are all those organizations that join right back into her, whether it be evangelical, Methodist, Lutheran, they all join back up with her. All right, now she was drunken with the blood of the saints. Notice that, and I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. John was, was marveling over this woman. Now, what does it speak about here? With the blood of the saints and with the martyrs of, of Jesus? In the times of Jesus, who was it? It was the Romans that came down and killed all those martyrs of Jesus. It was the Vatican, or excuse me, it was the Roman government under, uh, under Pilate that put Yeshua to death. They put the apostles to death. And after 325 AD, it was the Vatican itself when church and state were united that did the Crusades and were killing again Christians throughout the Middle East. It is today Rome that meets with Pope, or excuse me, Pope Francis meets with Erdogan that's going through Syria right now in Iraq and are killing the Christians, killing the wise men, the children of the wise men, the, the, the Yazdis. You don't think that's not a religious war over there? You don't think it's not a religious war against the Russian Orthodox and the Eastern Orthodox churches? Sure it is. Anybody that don't agree with them, they put them to death. And just like they did 1,500 years ago through the, through the uh, Crusades, they used the Muslim warriors to do so. Jeez. All right, so what's happened? We've put a pope... You know, of course, over there he has his crown on, as I shared with you. Let me go back to where it's at there. Uh, gosh, I forget exactly which one it was now. But anyway, I showed it to you a second ago. There it is. He's wearing his crown there on Mount Zion. So you see what happened when Tony Palmer goes there. He successfully galvanizes, uses Kenneth Copeland, which makes you wonder if Kenneth has not been a Jesuit from the beginning. And they galvanized the evangelical community and all these at this minister's meeting, they sucked them all in. Maybe not all of them. I don't know if all of them fell for it. He even talks in there. He says to the Pope, these, these are the big fish. He said, they got jets. They got planes. They got, they got tens of thousands of people in their churches. What a shame. Not a shame that you got that many people there, but it's a shame that you're misleading that many people. You're not, you're the hireling and you're not warning the sheep of the wolf that's coming back down to take Israel once again. All right? And so therefore, both the evangelical community, the Methodists, the Lutherans, those remnants of the house of Israel, right along with the Jewish people of the house of Judah, have allowed the Pope of Rome to sit in on Mount Zion and wear a crown on his head, and you've put a king back in place. Now, the only thing I can say good about it is just the process of redemption. Not what they're doing. But the fact that the king is once again there. You see what happened when Jesus, when he sent his apostles out, and he said to them, go on only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They did. They went to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They won many of them to Christ. 
But by the time Nicaea Rome came out with Constantine in 325 AD, they forsook Christ who had been their king, the Holy Spirit coming down upon them, the pillar of fire coming down upon them. They forsook the, the Spirit of God and put a man over them and put a pope over the whole church. And that was the house of Israel and the house of Judah, those remnant that had believed that the gospel was given by Jesus Christ, because not all the Jews believed it, as we can see today. The ones that have returned back, they're the children of those that never believed that Jesus was the Messiah. But nonetheless, you still put him in there as your king. This is where you went wrong. And what did they do? When the Pope drank there on that holy mountain, Mount Zion, it was prophesied in Obadiah. For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the nations drink continually. Yea, they shall drink and swallow down, and shall be as though they had not been. But in Mount Zion there shall be those that escape, and it shall be holy, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. See, kika shall shutate them, that's masculine plural, men only, that Pope Francis drank with there on the mountain. But then it also goes on. al Kodeshi upon my holy mountain. Ishatu kol hagawim, and, okay, tamid, and they can, that's the word continually, tamid. And they shall drink the nations, or the churches will drink continually. What is Revelation 17? You're drunk with the fornication. Because you, the fornication is you've taken and you went back and you've done an adulterous affair with Rome. God said to Israel, there will be no prostitutes in Israel. There will be no sodomites. You can't do this. That's no wonder why God says, come out of her, my people. Now notice this here. Orthodox Jews protest the disputed Last Supper site. They're crying out. The Orthodox community in Israel, they're praying and asking God, don't let the Pope come and take this place and sit in this place here. Why? You know why? Because God prophesied that would happen. And you shall cry out in that day because of your king whom you shall have chosen you. And the Lord will not answer you in that day. Notice, didn't say he wouldn't answer at all, but he says, I won't answer you in that day. The day that the Pope does it, he won't answer you. All right, Psalm 83, what did it say in Psalm 83? All right. O oh God, keep thou not silence. Hold not thy peace. Be not still, O God, for lo, thine enemies are in an uproar, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. The crown, they've lifted him up. They put the Pope there. It's a confederacy. They're confederate together against what? Against Israel. Not just, oh my gosh, friends, look here. They have consulted together, verse 6, with one consent against thee, and do they make a covenant, the tents of Adam, all of these, right? Oh, jeez. Jeez. Oh my gosh. Esau. All right. they're, against, they're against you, Lord. So terrible. Now, so Samuel, they fulfilled, the, those Jews on that Temple Mount, that, or over there on Mount Zion that day, fulfilled the prophecy when they cried out, and God didn't hear on that day. Let me, let me play a little clip again from this. This is where Pope Francis is actually talking. It says, of a simple man amongst the people who once said this, and listen to what he says here. I've never seen God begin a miracle without him finishing it well. He will complete this miracle of unity. I ask you to bless me, and I ask I and I bless you. From brother to brother, I embrace you. Thank you. Okay, now watch. They'll go into an uproar over it. And here comes Kenneth Copeland. And it was a success. Come on, the man asked us to pray for him. Oh, Father. Father, we, we answer. Now, the thing is, Tony Palmer says at this meeting that he comes in the spirit of Elijah. It's also recorded on the Catholic Herald. Like his mentor, Palmer, believed that Reformation had already ended. He bluntly challenged Luther's spiritual heirs to reject the Protestant label. 
It's like saying you're racist, even though you're living in a country that no longer has an apartheid system in place, he argued. When Francis wanted to reach out to the evangelicals after he was elected pope, he didn't do the obvious thing. He didn't ask the Pontifical Council for the Christian Unity to organize a conference or seek advice from a group of evangelicals and Catholics together in America, arguably the most advanced such dialogue in the world. Instead, he rang his old friend during a leisurely meeting at the Vatican. Palmer recorded a video of the pontiff of his, on his iPhone, designated an apostolic representative for the Christian unity by Francis. Palmer took the film to a minister's conference in Texas organized by prosperity gospel preacher Kenneth Copeland. Palmer introduced the film with what must count one of the great Christian orations of the 21st centuries. Brothers and sisters, Lutherans' protest is over, he said. He told the audible, audibly stunned audience that he was speaking to them in the spirit of Elijah, who prepared the way for something much greater than himself. Palmer, watch this, Palmer was unaware, of course, that he stood at the le uh, lectern. He had just months left to live. But the hindsight there was spine-tingling moment when he announced that he would introduce the papal video with a short prayer. This was a dying man's prayer, he said. And when you know that you are about to die, you certainly pray the most important prayers. Now, there's a lot of debate whether or not Tony Palmer ever died or not. And I'm not going to get into that debate here on, that, on this particular issue. But I find it rather eerie that he did die, if in fact he actually died. Because to me, even as the Catholic Herald is trying to point out, they're making him like John the Baptist, who when he came on the scene didn't live very long. But you see, Tony Palmer was not coming in the spirit of Elijah. And I have nothing against Tony Palmer either. But the point is, friends, they're trying to set up, they're trying, Psalm 83 is a confederacy against all of Israel. But at the same time, we have no one else to blame but ourselves for allowing the Pope of Rome to put a crown on and sit on Mount Zion. Yet it is prophecy being fulfilled. It ha we have to return home the way we left God. There has to be a king that does not belong who claims to be the king that sits in the place of God. And now the house of Israel who is scattered to all the four winds of the earth as well as the house of Judah have allowed that king to sit at Mount Zion and King David's tomb and declare himself to be the king of the earth. And to sit in the, and he already claims that he sits in the steed of Christ according to what's over his, on his crown, Vicarious filii dilii, instead of the Son of God, who was truly Israel's king. But I'm going to tell you something, though, that God revealed to me just recently. And before I do, let me just say this here. Revelation 18, 4, God says, or actually verse 3, For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through her abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins. All right? So the thing is, God revealed something to me that really stunned me. There's been always so much debate over who the two witnesses are. Now the Vatican has put forth Tony Palmer as Elijah. But in the Catholic Herald, they also mentioned that there would be, or I think Tony Palmer actually said it, all those that come in the spirit of reconciliation are coming in the spirit of Elijah. So they're trying to make the spirit of Elijah a very broad painting there. At the same time, we realize that they have consulted against thy hidden ones. In other words, what are they going to do about these two witnesses of Revelation 11 that are to return in this last days? How do they deal with this problem? Because they know they will come for a restoration as well, or a reconciliation back to God. So Rome had to counteract that. So they were using the works of church and state together. They had John Kerry working on a nine-month negotiation. They got a deal for the Vatican to get the old city. 
Now President Trump is in there. Now he's the King Cyrus that's going to bring back uh, the, the building of the third temple. Don't you see all the pieces coming together? Don't you see them playing everybody? And there's always, as I said, been a debate. Is it Elijah and Enoch? Some even say it's John the Baptist that comes, or John the Revelator that comes back, or whoever they want to say it is. Now, I've always held that it was actually Elijah and Moses. And then God revealed something to me. And I've heard ministers say that believe it's Elijah and Moses, that the reason why they believe it's Elijah and Moses is that Elijah's to the, all the nations and Moses was to the uh, Jews only. That's not it. No. Elijah is to restore all things. According to what Jesus prophesied when they asked him after Mount Transfiguration, they said, doesn't the scripture, doesn't the scribes say that, the, that Elias must first come, which is Elijah? And Jesus said, truly he shall first come and restore all things. Restore what? The words of Jesus that have been trampled upon for the last 2,000 years by the churches. But why would it be Moses? Because where we first left God, friends, wasn't even with Samuel the prophet. As I said at the beginning of the video, it's when we rejected God coming down and having a personal relationship with us. When we rejected the pillar of fire, the spirit of almighty God to come dwell within us that was, by the way, restored at Pentecost on the day of Pentecost when only 120 people could get in one mind and one accord, not 9,800 different denominations. And when they got in one mind and one accord, then the Spirit of God, like it was in the days of Moses, came down upon them, and there were tongues, cloven tongues, like unto a fire that rested upon each one of them. Not that the Catholics speak in tongues or that the Pentecostals speak in tongues. It was that they spoke, they, oh, jeez. I'm not against speaking in tongues, friends, but let me tell you something. That is not, it's not what you think it is. When, they, when Peter stood up there, they, he spoke in one language, one tongue, and they said, how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Go look at the book of Jasher. That's another issue altogether. But anyway, why Moses? Why would Moses be that other witness? Because we rejected God when Moses was the prophet. And God wanted that personal relationship with us. And Moses was his prophet at the time. And Moses was the one speaking to him face to face, lip to ear. And God says to Moses, prepare the people, I will come down before them. But when God began to descend and the trumpets did sound, the people cried out and said, let not God speak, let Moses speak. Let, him, let God only speak to him lest we all die. Isn't it interesting how that at the last day there's going to be a trumpet again? Are you going to be ready for when God comes? You see, we have to go all the way back to where we left him. The king, through the prophet Samuel, was one place. That's what the Pope has done now. All 12 tribes now have effectively in 2014 allowed Pope Francis to be the king taking the place of Christ. You know, Pope Francis is just a man. He probably don't know no better himself. But the thing is, you allowed it to happen. I say you, I'm speaking of the evangelical leaders that allowed that to happen. You were the last stopping place for him to be able to pull it off. But you allowed it just like the political government in Israel allowed him to come there as well. They threw the Jews out of the, out of the uh, King David's tomb the following week for other uh, churches to come in there and have a communion service in there, throw the Jews out and don't allow them to pray in the tomb so you could have a communion service there as well. Yeah, you allowed your king to come. All right? but he's got to fail now. Just like Netanyahu failed, so will the Pope of Rome fail as well. He will not be, he will not work as a king. And then you will, then, then Elijah and Moses can come. Then Elijah can restore the word back to what Yeshua said. And then Moses can do what? Introduce you to the Lord that was rejected at Mount Sinai.
to where the pillar of fire can once more fall, the Spirit, the Holy Ghost can once more fall upon the people. Not saying the people don't have the Holy Ghost today. I don't mean it like that. But it's a process of redemption that will open the doors for Christ to return. For the house of Israel, excuse me, the house of Judah to recognize that they had pierced him according to the Zechariah, prophecy of Zechariah, and for the house of Israel to be restored back by Elijah, the words that were supposed to be restored. That's not happened, friends. I know there's many that have claimed that it's that been done, but to me, it's been Jesuit works the entire time trying to find a way to mimic God's word. It's coming, though. It's coming. Will you stand with this ministry? We're not a hireling. We're willing to warn you about the wolf coming. But if you'll stand, if you believe this type of ministry, we do need your support. It's what makes us able to share with you and to dedicate daily to tell you the truth. Visit our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org. You can give there. You can also give there on Israeli News Live on live stream. Or you can do it by mail. At the end of the video, we have both address here in the Czech Republic as well as in the United States. The post office is holding our mail in the U.S., so we will retrieve it there when we go back next month, at the end of next month. But we thank you. We thank you for your support and your love for this ministry because there's very few that are willing to tell you the truth. Jeremiah was all alone. Isaiah, they cut him in half for telling the truth. There's not a good end for too many people that are willing to really tell you the truth. But I will, as long as I have breath in my body, I will tell you the truth. I'm not going to play around with it. And I won't sell out. I'm Stephen Benoon with Israeli News Live. Visit our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org.